Gentlemen, it's an awesome thing to raise children, and it's a frightening thing to think about your children as they go away to college. In fact, I think one of the reasons we get so frightened when we think about our kids going away is, especially if we have a daughter, is we understand as men what men are like, and that sweet little thing, when we send them away, we get a little nervous. And so the story goes that uh, this couple, this mom and dad, lived on the East Coast, and they were sending their daughter to the West Coast, and they sent her away to college, and every day they went to the mailbox to get that first letter. A week went by. Two weeks went by. A month went by. They didn't know what happened. Finally, one day, this letter came in the mail. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry that I've not written to you for so long, but all my stationery was lost the night the dormitory was burned down by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now. The doctor says my eyesight should be back to normal sooner or later. The wonderful boy, Bill, who rescued me from the fire, kindly offered to share his apartment with me until I found a new place to live. You always wanted a grandchild. So you'll be glad to know that you'll be grandparents next month. Love, Mary. At the bottom, there was a PS. It says, please disregard the above exercise in creative writing. <laughs> there was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in mathematics. And I wanted to be sure that you received this news in the proper perspective. I want to read a letter to you. I want to tell you about a man. He grew up in Ohio. His parents divorced when he was only two years old. He went to live with his mother, her parents, and two uncles. His uncles meant a great deal to him, but they frequently disappointed him by making promises to do things, but then never showing up. His grandfather drank too much. His mom had to work. A stepfather finally came into his life and he showed the young boy very little interest or love. His mom and stepdad didn't get along very well. This young man loved sports. In fact, he loved them so much that he played them all the time, night and day, every free moment because that gave him a way to get away from the house. Somehow, some way, when he was a young boy in high school, he came into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Somehow, some way, he was given a scholarship to play ball in college. Somehow, some way, God called him from a coaching career to go into the gospel ministry. He was a PE major and went to seminary to study Hebrew and Greek. He worked with students for years. He's had his own family, three wonderful children. One died five days after delivery. His daughter is married. His son just turned 17 years old. How'd he do it? How can you go through so much hurt how can you go through so much disappointment? How can you have such poor models? How can you live life without a real dad, with no encouragement to succeed? Gentlemen, the man that I'm describing is me. And today I want to tell you what I've learned over the years, because I want you to be a great dad. I have never met a father in my life who wanted to be a failure as a father. 
All dads I know want to be great dads. But the problem is often fathers have failed because no one's taught them how to be a great dad. Maybe there wasn't a great model at home. Whatever the reason, I want you to understand today, gentlemen, that we are here this weekend to create a revolution. And each of you needs to be a part of creating that revolution. One of my greatest heroes, James Dobson, said it this way. The Western world stands at a great crossroads in its history. It is my opinion that our very survival as a people will depend upon the presence or absence of masculine leadership in millions of homes. He says, I believe with everything within me that husbands hold the keys to the preservation of the family. Men, you're the key. Dads, you're the key. And that's what we want to talk about today. The scripture we're looking at today comes, if you have your Bible, in the last book of the Old Testament. The original Hebrew pronounces this as Malachi. You know it as Malachi. So if you'll turn to the last book, let me give you some background. The problem is that the nation of Israel is under a severe economic pressure. In other words, the dads in the country are working hard, getting less. They're never home. The kids are looking for them to come home, but they come home late. They get up early. They're never together. They're just too busy. Kind of reminds me of the story of the little girl who came in one night and talked to her mom and said, Mom, I don't understand, Dad. Said He comes home at night. He eats a quick bite of dinner, and then he goes to his study. He's got three or four briefcases. He opens up all of his work. And then I never get to spend any time with him. And she said, well, sweetheart, you've got to understand. Said, Dad's got to do that because, you know, we have a place in the mountains. We've got a boat to fish in. Said, we've got the beautiful home. Said, you're in a private school. And by the way, he just can't get all that stuff done at work. And the little girl with great insight said, well, why don't they put him in a slower group? The people in Israel had tasted a little bit of spiritual revival. As someone said, it was 16 miles wide, but only a sixteenth of an inch deep. Their religion was a ritual, it was a routine, but they didn't have the relationship. And if you read Malachi, you'll quickly discover that these people showed God disrespect because they brought improper sacrifices to the Lord's altar. The people, the men, had given God a token, but they had not given God their hearts. God was watching. He knew their hearts. He knew their motivations. And gentlemen, I want to tell you today, God is watching you, and he knows everything about your lives. Now, that may make you feel a little uncomfortable, but you need to remember this. It's like an old coach of mine said when I played ball in college. One day he was yelling at me, and I was holding my head down, and he came over. He knew I was down. He put his arm around me. He said, John, he said, what you really need to worry about is when I stop yelling at you. When God stops watching, when he ceases to care about you, that's when you better be worried. And so, therefore, the result is that family life had crumbled because their faith was phony. They were, they were basically afflicted with what I would call insensitivity. And so the book of Malachi and the prophet Malachi presents a challenge to each of us today to allow God to invade every arena of our lives. And so the prophet Malachi this morning comes crashing through again and saying, men of Minneapolis and men of America, I want you to be the dads that I want you to be. And so, Father, today, listen up, and I want you to take notes because if you'll do some of the practical things that I'm going to suggest, it will change your life. You'll never be the same again. It's tough to be a dad. Someone said that leading a family through the chaos of American culture is like leading a small patrol through a minefield. It's tough. Let me read some of the casualties for you. One out of two marriages ends in divorce. 
I come from Florida, and I talked to a judge the other day, and he said six of ten marriages in the state of Florida end in divorce. The United States of America has the highest divorce rate of any country in the world. In 1960, one out of every ten households was maintained by a woman with no husband present. In 1986, one out of every six households was maintained by a woman with no husband present. Tonight, enough teenagers to fill the Rose Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, the Super Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Fiesta Bowl, and the average Super Bowl will practice prostitution to support drug addictions. One million teenager girls will get pregnant out of wedlock this year. 500,000 of those girls will abort their babies. Of all the 1,400-year-old or 14-year-old girls alive today, 40% will become pregnant by their 19th birthday. 60% of all church-involved teenagers are sexually active. 66% of American high school seniors have used illegal drugs. And every 78 seconds, a teenager in America attempts suicide. It's tough to be a dad because it's tough to be a dad. I love the story one day. I had a group of men around the, around the country meeting in Orlando. And my wife sent my secretary into the meeting and said, you need to get home immediately. And so I went home. My son at that time was around five or six years old. I said, what's the problem? And she said, just look out in the backyard. And I mean, there was a geyser of water coming up out of the spigot. And what my son had done is gone next door. My wife told him not to go next door gone next door and gotten a brick from the next door neighbor, came over, hit the head of the spigot, and the water was just going all over the place. The wind was blowing. It was everywhere. It was a nightmare. So, you know, I tried to correct my son, and we called the plumber, and I found out that night it only cost, it was a $2 part. But, of course, it cost $60 to fix it. And so that evening, my son was lying in the bed, and I went up there, and as I always did, and I mean, he didn't want to talk that night very much. It had been a rough day, and his mama had gotten all over his case. So I said, Luke, it's kind of been a tough day, hasn't it? He said, yes, sir, Dad, it has been a tough day. Now, his mama was around the other bedroom, and all of a sudden, as I got up to leave, he sat up in the bed, he's five years old, and he pointed around the corner, and he said, Dad, I want to tell you one thing. You need to do something about that woman. Hey, it's tough to be a dad. Hey, I got some good news for you. Get this one now. There are no perfect dads, just progressing ones. Remember that. All right, now I want to give you some keys. I want to give you a few keys to be an effective father. Get this stuff down, and by the grace of God and the encouragement of one another, this will absolutely transform your home and your cities. Get it down. Number one, you must be a dad that has his priorities right. Someone said if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Aristotle said that an archer has a much greater chance of hitting the target if he can see it. The objectives of your life will determine the outcome of your life. So of all men, you as fathers need to understand what you're aiming at. So the first area, the first priority you've got to get together is your personal faith in life. You must make sure your life is on track. You've got to get your own personal stuff together. You can't give something away to your sons or daughters if you don't have something to give. Listen to me now. What you are is much more important than what you do because what you are will determine what you do. And that's why when you look to the Scripture, for example, and I think of Matthew chapter number 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus is teaching on what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. If you, you, basically what he was saying there is, men, the circumstances of your life are not the key, it's your character. And so Jesus begins to take his disciples and he said, I want to build you deeply inside. And so if you go to that fifth chapter of Matthew, in the third verse it says, and blessed, Jesus says, are the poor in spirit. Now the word blessed basically means not happy because the circumstances are favorable, but it means 
blessed, well-off, happy to be congratulated is the man who is going in the right direction in life. And so he begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And this is what Mike was talking about last night. Blessed is the man that comes to the understanding that he is totally spiritually bankrupt before a holy God. That there's no way in and of yourself any of us can come to the Father. None of us. And so you come by God's grace to the Father, but what you need to understand is when this verse is translated, it's translated this way. Blessed are those who initially understand their spiritual bankruptcy, their poverty before a holy God, but who continually maintain that attitude. That's the kind of man that God wants to build. That your children see you in true humility because you understand before a holy God who you are. Then it goes on and it says, Blessed are those who mourn. That means to be sorry for your sin and sorry enough to quit. Men, when your sons look at you and your daughters look at you, what do they see? Do they see a pure man? Do they see a man that, that hungers and thirsts for the right things of God? Do they see a, a man that is willing to mourn over his mistakes and ask his children to forgive him? Is that the way you conduct yourself? Is that what your kids see? Men, the most manly thing in the world you can do is to come to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, when all those fellows, you fellows came down here last night, I had tears in my eyes. I said, that's the most manly thing these men have ever done. And can you imagine... Can you imagine etched in the minds of your children and your sons and daughters that picture of you humbly coming forward to submit your life to the Heavenly Father? They'll never forget that. And I want to tell you something, dads. You will never be a great father until you are led by the Heavenly Father. And so what will the effect of that be? When your sons and daughters see you following Jesus Christ, let me tell you what will happen. The Lord will create a hunger in their heart for Jesus. And that's what you want. Secondly, you also not only need to be getting your own life together in terms of your faith, but you also need to remember the last message we just heard, and that is the marital area of your life. You need to love your kid's mama. That's your number one goal within your family because you see your children will learn to be husbands and wives and mom and daddies by what they see in your home the home is to be listen the home is to be a model on earth of what heaven is like is that what your home's like and so men you need to make mama number one and that means when you go back tomorrow it's mother's day i mean you need you need to absolutely raise the roof with celebration. You need to express your love openly and tastefully. You know, I've had men tell me, you know, I've never seen my dad hug or hold or kiss my mama. Never seen it. I have a friend that tells a story about coming home one day with his, and he and his wife were, were embracing in the den, and his son came in with a friend. And as he looked in, he said, hold it, don't, don't go in yet. He said, and, and his friend said, what's going on? He said, oh, my mom and dad are in there again, smooching. He said, they always do that. They embarrass me. And his friend said, hey, let's go on in. He said, and then he said this. He said, it must be great to have a father who loves your mother. I don't even know who my dad is. And so, men, you have good manners. You love on your wife. You do, the, you do the essential things to pour your life into her, to give your life away. And you know what will happen? The result will be that you will build great security in the life of your children. Now, get this. This is the most important thing I'm going to say. Your kids, to a large extent, are going to become just like you are. So here's the question. Are you living your life in such a way that you would be proud of what they're going to become? 
And if there's a dichotomy here, then what you need to do is to bridge that gap and to make the changes that need to be made. Secondly, you need to understand your kids. For 15 years, I worked with teenagers, and this is what teenagers have told me. My parents just don't understand. My dad just doesn't understand me. Well, let me tell you something. You need to go to school on your kids. You need to understand your children. You need to understand the, the overarching gap of how God works in a kid's life. Let me give you a little overview of that. First of all, there's what I would call the rest period. That's ages one to three. You got the terrible twos in there. Basically, the parents are in control. The child is very dependent. Then you move from three to six years old, and that's the panic stage because all they begin to do then is say, why, why? And you keep saying, I wonder why they ask those questions. Then from six to 11 is kind of a rest period because the kids want to please their mom and daddy. They're kind of nice then. Then we move from 11 years old to 15 years old, and I call this the super panic period. These are the cave years. I mean, they live in the room. You hear something coming from out, you just stick the food under the door. I mean, it's, they get kind of sassy, and actually, if you want to put it how the real are, sometimes they're just a bunch of big snots. It's a tough deal. Then from 16 on to adulthood, it's what I call daytime. It's like the Viet Cong have hit. I mean, you don't know what's going to go on. You know, I used to say, you know, if you just freeze them when they hit 13 and thaw them out when they hit 20, everything would be great. <laughs> but here's what I want you to see. You're moving your kids from, when they're younger, from dependence to independence. You're moving them from control when they're young to autonomy. You're moving them from protecting them from failure to allowing them to fail. Now, during this process, as you understand your kids individually, there are four major decisions you need to help them with, four big ones. Number one, their life work. You need to give them some direction to that. Number two, their higher education. Number three, their life mate. And number four, their adult commitment to Jesus Christ. Those are four things you need to be responsible for helping them with as they move along. So you need to understand your kids. Third thing, this is good stuff. Now hang on, put it down. This is great. Thirdly, you need to learn to communicate your love. A recent survey by America's most popular teen magazine revealed that only 4.1% of the teenage girls in America feel they could go to their father to talk about a serious problem. Even more recently, U.S. Today, A Today, published the eye-opening results of a study of teens under stress. When asked where they turned for help in crisis, the most popular choice was music. The second choice was peers. The third choice was television. And amazing as it may sound, moms were down the list at 31, and dads came in at number 48. Gentlemen, I have met men across this country with tears in their eyes who've told me, you know what? My daddy has never told me eye to eye, man to man, that he loves me. And so how do you tell your kids you love them? How do you express your love to them? Let me just give you a couple of hints. This is great. Number one, you've got to do it with your time. I mean, this gets right down to where we live every day. A couple, uh, a number of months ago, I had the privilege of marrying or doing a ceremony for my daughter when she got married. I walked her down, and then I gave her away, and then I moved around, and, and the guy that she married, his daddy's a preacher, so you had these two preachers up there marrying their kids. It was absolutely wonderful. And as I made some comments during the service, I'll, I'll, I said this one story that happened when she was very young. I'll never forget it. We were walking in a mall when she was around six or seven years old in Houston, Texas, eating a big old ice cream cone. It was sticky and it was all over us. But she looked up at me as we were walking along, and I'll never forget it, those beautiful eyes. She looked at my face, and she said, Dad, I just love being with you. Men, do your kids love being with you? Would they rather be with you than with anyone else? That's the way it's supposed to be. But you've got to be a little creative. You can't, you know, sometimes we bore our kids. 
I love one of my friends, Bruce Larson, who said that he really tried hard to be a great dad and to be creative. And he said one day he told his wife, he said, let's go out of town this weekend, but I'm going to pretend that I'm on a speaking engagement. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be down of town about five miles out in the country. And I'm going to be dressed up in this, this outfit. I'm going to have an old ragged shirt on and a hat pulled over my face. And I'm not going to shave tonight. And, and I'm going to be hitchhiking. And I want you, as I come along, to stop and pick me up. And so the kids were in the car. They said, where's Dad? Well, Dad's going to meet us there. And so they went around about five miles out of town and finally rounded this curve. And they see this old guy standing on the side of the road, kind of bent over like this. And so his wife pulls on. He said, Mom, don't do that. You know you're not supposed to pick up hitchhikers. Oh, we got to do it. We've got to help this guy out. So they pull over, and this old guy gets in the car and pulls his hats up. Hey, kids, how you doing? Let's go on vacation. You got to be creative. A number of years ago, my son, I don't know what birthday it was. I think he was in the seventh grade, but I called the principal up at his school, and I said, this is Dr. Tolson. I said, my son Luke's in the seventh grade. He said, yeah, we know him. I said, well, I said, it's his birthday, and I want to take him to lunch, but I want to surprise him. So I said, I'm coming over, and I said, when I get in your office, if you'll just call him to your office, and let's go from there. And so they called him to the office, and he thought something was wrong. I said, he came in the office. He said, Dad, what's wrong? I said, are you hungry? He said, yeah. I said, well, let's go eat. He loved it. He'll never for Listen, what you've got to do, <laughs> here's my point. What you've got to do is create memories in their lives so that one day they'll look back and say, boy, my dad was great. Man, we had so much fun together. We just hung out together. It was absolutely wonderful. One businessman was asked, what are you giving your son for Christmas? He said, a piece of paper, and it reads, To my son, I give you one hour each week, two hours every Sunday, to be used as you wish. Isn't that a great gift? I want you to never underestimate what your time with your sons and daughters means. Charles Francis Adams, the 19th century political figure and diplomat, kept a diary, and one day he entered this. Went fishing with my son today, a day wasted. His son, Brooke Adams, also kept a diary, which is still in existence. And on that same day, Brooke Adams made this entry. Went fishing with my father today, the most wonderful day of my life. Don't ever underestimate that time. Even if all you do is just hang out, then hang out together. But also, you need to do it by your interest. For so many years, I tried to get my kids to do what I like, like play basketball, play baseball, do that stuff. That wasn't their main interest. And then finally, one day, my son came to me and said, Dad, if you really like me, then you're going to go do what I like to do. I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to go paintballing. I don't know if you know what that is or not. Some of you do. Well, let me tell you, it took me almost a year before I went the first time, and I got there, and they drilled me, and I never went back. And if you don't know what paintballing is, ask it around. Some of these guys know. Do what they want to do. Thirdly, you've also got to love your kids and communicate your love by listening. A teenager said this. You know what I am? He said, I'm a comma. So what do you mean you're a comma? He said, well, I'll be talking with my dad, and he'll say something, and then when I start to talk, he pauses. He never interrupts me. But when I'm through, he starts up again where he left off. What I say doesn't really matter because I'm just a comma. Men, you need to learn to listen to your kids. One wise man in authority asked one day, he said, what is the number one most important ingredient of a quality life? And the man said, attention. He said, well, could you expand on that? He said, yes, attention, attention. He said, well, I think I agree with you, but could you tell me a little bit more? He said, yeah, attention, attention, attention. That's what your kids are craving. They are craving your attention. 
One time my son was trying to talk to me. I can't remember what I was doing, but gentlemen, look at me right now. Get this. And so little Luke came up to me, and he had something important to say, and he took his hands, and he grabbed my cheek, and he said, Dad, when I'm talking to you, listen to me. <laughs> That's what they're saying, men. Just down-to-earth, practical old stuff. A kid who wrote his first essay for school, his topic was what my dog means to me. My dog means somebody nice and quiet to be with. He does not say do like my mother, or don't like my dad, or stop like my big brother. My dog Spot and I just sit together quiet, and I like him, and he likes me. It's kind of neat, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's what they want. And so therefore, you've got to communicate your love. And then finally, you've got to begin to learn how to affirm your kids. And this is the key. The greatest disease in America today, whether you're 9, 19, or 90, is what I would call a low self-esteem. And if you want your kids to be healthy, and if you want them to have a healthy view of themselves, then you have to have the healthy view of you, and you have to have a healthy view of them. For so many years, I worried so much about what other people thought about me. And then recently, all of a sudden, it dawned on me. All those people that for so many years, I worried about what they thought about me, they weren't even thinking about me. So this guy was out in the West Coast in California around San Francisco. He bought him a brand new red Porsche. He shined that sucker up. It was a Friday night, and I mean, he was looking forward to Saturday because he had a plan. He cared what, about people, what people thought about him. So he said, my plan is I'm going to go out and I'm going to ride that red Porsche, and when I see people, I'm going to zoom past them and look in my rearview mirror and just beam with pride. For one solid hour, he drove and didn't pass one car. He was deflated. He was ready to turn around and go home. When finally he turned the curb and he looked up ahead, he said, ah, there's a car. But the closer he got, he saw that it wasn't a car, but it was a little farmer on a motor scooter with a straw hat and a kerchief around his neck. He said, well, if this is the best I can do, then I'll do this. So he stuck that sucker up about in the second gear going about 60 miles an hour. <laughs> Goes by the guy. The next thing he knows, he hears the story. <laughs> The little farmer zips past him on a scooter. He says, what in the fat's going on? He puts it up the throat. Goes by about 90. There goes the farmer on the scooter. He says, I can't stand it. He gets it up the about fourth gear, 120. Going by. They go, there goes the farmer. He said, what in the world is going on? He sticks it up in that last gear, 160. He gets right next to the guy, just a little past him. And like the prodigal son, he finally comes to his senses. He said, this is stupid. He puts on the brakes. Ah! He stops. The farmer goes, ah! he stops. And then the farmer gets off of his scooter. He comes over to the old boy. He's, he's white as a sheet. He's wiping his head off. He takes that hat off. He's got that little white streak up there where the sun didn't get to it. <laughs> and he looks at this guy, leans on the window. He's Thank God, brother, you stopped. He said, my suspenders were caught on your side view mirror. <laughs> Woo, what a ride. I'm going to bring it together now. Stick with me. And so... One afternoon, a young baseball player for the Houston Astros asked me to come in and meet with him. And he said, John, let me tell you, so when I used to play ball in high school, I'd come home, my dad would say, how many hits you get? And I said, Dad, I went three for five today. He said, why didn't you go five for five? And that young professional baseball player sitting in the bowels of the Astrodome, literally at that very point, had a nervous breakdown, and I had to co call the general manager, and the general manager had to call 911, and they came and they took this boy away, and this young man never put on a baseball uniform again. He was immobilized because he didn't have a relationship with his dad. Listen, 
I, if you don't get anything else I've said, I want you to get what I'm going to say in the next two or three minutes. Your self-concept will be determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. So if you draw a triangle and you're at the base, whoever occupies the apex of that triangle, what you think they think about you will determine how you feel about yourself. And the only person you can put at the apex of that triangle that will love you infinitely and forever is the God of the universe. Now listen. <laughs> Young men and fathers and men, listen to this now because this is going to touch your heart. I want you to put these things down. Number one, how do you build a good, solid self-esteem? How do you become a person of significance? If I would have known this when I was a teenager, it would have changed my life. And so much heartache that I went through for so many years, if I would have known this, if someone would have taken the time to tell me. Number one, it's so simple, but it's profound. God made you. He made you in his image, and he, you're not an accident looking for a place to happen. If you look at Ephesians 2.10, it says that you are God's workmanship. And that little word workmanship is translated into Greek, poiema. Translated means you are God's highest work of art. He didn't make anything any greater than you. You got the very stamp of God on your life. Number two, he loves you. He accepts you just like you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I have a friend in Orlando. He said his daughter is a brilliant student, but she was petrified in this advanced English class and wanted to get out of it. And so they went to meet the teacher. This is good now. Hang on. And the teacher said, well, I didn't know you were having a problem. And she said, well, I want to get out of the class. The teacher, being a very wise teacher, Liz, said to the girl, said, if I gave you an A, if you were guaranteed of an A right now, would you stay in the class? The girl said, you bet your life I would. And so the teacher said, well, let me tell you. You've got an A. Gentlemen, you know what God's saying to us this morning? Through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have an A. You've got an A. You've got an A. You've already made the grade. Relax and enjoy it. Can I tell you something? I don't ever, ever, I want you to ever forget this. Jesus Christ will never love you any more than he loves you right now. Jesus Christ will never love you any less than he does right now. There is nothing you can ever do to get him to love you any more than he loves you right now. Whew. Man, that'll set you free. Number three, Christ died for you. Number four, God has gifted you. Number five, God has a plan for your life. I have to tell this story. I can't tell you why, but I've got to tell it because I think there's some people here that need to hear it. In Dallas, Texas, there's a school for deaf mutes. And so these kids from 8 years old to 18 years old can't hear, can't speak. And a friend told me that what they do is you're allowed to come as a visitor, sit in the class, and there's a time for questions. And if you want to ask a question, you go to the board and you write down your question. And then one of the students comes up to the board and writes down their response. One day, a new member of the board of this institution came to visit a class. And when it came time for questions, he got up and moved to the board and wrote a question that was seemingly so cruel. But here's what the man wrote. If God loves you, why did he make you deaf-mutes? And a little 13-year-old girl got up with tears running all down her cheeks, took a piece of chalk, and with incredible self-acceptance and understanding, wrote the following, Even so, Father, it seemeth good in your sight. You got an A. You got an A. That's what he thinks of you. And that A is there, it's good, and will never, ever, 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 ever be erased. 
And so, gentlemen, as I close up, I want to challenge you with this today. I believe that God gives us children, not for us just to raise, but so that we might be able to grow up. September the 1st, my wife had a stroke. As I came home one evening after two weeks of being in the hospital, I went in the living room and I started to weep. I mean, more than a weep, I was crying. My son Luke, who's with me today, came up behind me, put his arm around me, and he started to cry too. And then he said this to me, with great insight, he said, Dad, go ahead and cry. It'll do you good. That's tough, man, when old dad begins to learn from his son. Soren Kierkegaard tells about a make-believe country where only ducks live. One Sunday morning, all the ducks came into church, waddled down the aisle, waddled to their pews, and squatted down. Then the duck minister came up and opened the duck Bible in the duck pulpit. He opened it up and he said, Ducks, you have wings, and with wings you can fly like eagles. You can soar into the sky. Ducks, you have wings. And all the ducks said, Amen, and got up and waddled home. Men, do not waddle home. Are you up to the challenge? I can't hear. Are you up to the challenge? Are you up to the challenge? All right. We're going to close now with a very, very, very special moment. It's only going to take us a couple of minutes, but it may be the highlight of, of, of this day, at least up to this point. And you're going to have to listen to me very closely because I want to do this quickly, but this is a very, very meaningful thing that we're going to do in the next couple of minutes. I would like to have all the young men, sons in this audience to stand right now, wherever you are, if you'll just stand. Look at them all over. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Give them a hand. All right, young men, thank you. I want you to stay standing. All the young men stay standing, and I want you to look right at me. I want to tell you a couple things. In a relay race, the most important part of the relay race is the passing of the baton. You're absolutely the key to what's going to happen in our generation. Y'all got some daddies around here that love you. Maybe your daddy isn't here, but if he could be, he'd love you. If he knew how, maybe. But you're loved and you have an A. Young man, I want, I want you to know a couple things as we put this together this, this afternoon or this morning. And that is it. Number one, I want you to be committed to Jesus Christ. If you've not made a commitment to Christ, before this day is over, I want you to do business with him. I came to know Christ when I was in the ninth grade in high school, the most important thing I ever did in my life. And let me tell you something. I've never met a young man in my life who's ever come to know Jesus Christ for real who's ever been disappointed. Never. Not one. Never. Young men, the most manly thing you can ever do is to come to Christ. Number two, would you commit your life to get into this book every day and to learn it and to do it? Number three, I want you to hang around your friends who love Jesus and you encourage each other and commit yourselves to living for Jesus Christ. Number four, I want you to be patient with your mom and daddy. Be patient with them and pray for them and know that they're special. And finally, I want you to be obedient to your parents. Honor your parents. And so, Dad, if your son is here, or sons, I know there are some, we have a lot of sons here. Dad, if your sons are here right now, I want you to stand next to them, and I want you to put your arm around them as best you can.
It was great. As the rest of you are seated, I want you to just pray silently. But dads, those of you that are standing, if there's, if there's a son here that your father's not here, gentlemen, if you'll stand next to that boy so that he's got somebody to represent his dad. And in the next moment, here's what I want you to do. Just bow your head, and I want you to look at your sons. And this is what I want you to do. First of all, I want you to look right in each of their eyes, and I want you to say, son, I love you. And then I want you to tell them there is absolutely nothing in this world that you could ever do that would cause me to stop loving you. I want you to do that right now. I love you, son. There's nothing you could ever do to stop me from loving you. Isn't that great? Gentlemen, there are some men here today that have never heard that the Father, that your Father loves you. But I want to tell you something. Your Heavenly Father loves you. He's the one that loves you. He'll fill that hole. He cares. Gentlemen, what you're witnessing right here is probably one of the most tender moments in these father and these son's life. Jesus, I just thank you so much for what's going on right now and what's going to continue to go on as godly men and their sons band together. Well, I've got one more thing, gentlemen. What a moment. I want everyone quietly to stand. And I want every, all the dads in this room, kind of like taking the scout's oath, I want everyone in this room, all the dads, to raise your right hand. And I want you to make this pledge as a father. And repeat after me if this is sincerely what you want to do. Here we go. I promise before God and these witnesses to be a faithful and loving dad that I will be a part of changing America by being a godly dad. Amen. 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 Thank you.